Welcome back to chapter 4 of Lord of the Flies. In this chapter, I want you to pay close attention to the theme of savagery versus civilization. And this chapter is titled, Painted Faces and Long Hair. The first rhythm that they became used to was the slow swing from dawn to quick dusk. They accepted the pleasures of morning, the bright sun, the whelming sea, and sweet air, as a time when play was good and life so full that hope was not necessary and therefore forgotten. Toward noon, as the floods of light fell more nearly to the perpendicular, the stark colors of the morning were smooth in pearl and opalescence, and the heat, as though the impending sun's height gave it momentum, became a blow that they ducked, running to the shade and lying there, perhaps even sleeping. Strange things happened at midday. The glittering sea rose up, moved apart in planes of blatant impossibility. The coral reef and the few stunted palms that clung to the more elevated parts would float up into the sky, would quiver, be plucked apart, run like raindrops on a wire, or be repeated as in an odd succession of mirrors. Sometimes land loomed where there was no land, and flicked out like a bubble as the children watched. Piggy discounted all this learnedly as a mirage, and since no boy could reach even the reef over the stretch of water where the snapping sharks waited, they grew accustomed to these mysteries and ignored them, just as they ignored the miraculous throbbing stars. At midday the illusions merged into the sky, and there the sun gazed down like an angry eye. Then, at the end of the afternoon, the mirage subsided, and the horizon became level and blue and clipped as the sun declined. That was another time of comparative coolness, but menaced by the coming of the dark. When the sun sank, darkness dropped on the island like an extinguisher, and soon the shelters were full of restlessness under the remote stars. Nevertheless, the northern European tradition of work, play, and food right through the day made it possible for them to adjust themselves wholly to this new rhythm. The little and Percival had clearly crawled into a shelter and stayed there. Excuse me. The little and Percival had early crawled into a shelter and stayed there for two days, talking, singing, and crying, till they thought him batty and were faintly amused. Ever since then he had been peaked, red-eyed, and miserable, a little un who played little and cried often. The smaller boys were now known by the generic title of little uns. The decrease in size from Ralph down was gradual, and though there was a dubious region inhabited by Simon and Robert and Maurice, Nevertheless, no one had any difficulty in recognizing biggins at one end and little ones at the other. The undoubted little ones, those aged about six, led a quite distinct and at the same time intense life of their own. They ate most of the day, picking fruit where they could reach it, and not particular about ripeness and quality. They were used now to stomach aches and a sort of chronic diarrhea. They suffered untold terrors in the dark, and huddled together for comfort. Apart from food and sleep, they found time for play, aimless and trivial, in the white sand by the bright water. They cried for their mothers much less often than might be, have been expected. They were very brown and filthily dirty. They obeyed the summons of the conch, partly because Ralph blew it, and he was big enough to be a link with the adult world of authority, and partly because they enjoyed the entertainment of the assemblies. But otherwise, they seldom bothered with the biggins, and their passionately emotional and corporate life was their own. They had built castles in the sand at the bar of the little river. These castles were about one foot high, and were decorated with shells, withered flowers, and interesting stones. Round the castles was a complex of marks, tracks, walls, railway lines that were of significance only if inspected with the eye at beach level. The little ones played here, if not happily, at least with absorbed attention, and often as many as three of them would play the same game together. Three were playing here now. Henry was the biggest of them. He was also a distant relative of that other boy whose mulberry-marked face had not been seen since the evening of the great fire. But he was not old enough to understand this, and if he had been told that the other boy had gone home in an aircraft, he would have accepted the statement without fuss or disbelief. 
Henry was a bit of a leader this afternoon because the other two were Percival and Johnny, the smallest boys on the island. Percival was a mouse co was mouse colored and had not been very attractive even to his mother. Johnny was well built with fair hair and a natural belligerence. Just now he was being obedient because he was interested, and the three children kneeling in the sand were at peace. Belligerent means that you like to fight or you like war. Not well behaved, basically, is what they're talking about here. Roger and Maurice came out of the forest. They were relieved from duty at the fire and had come down for a swim. Roger led the way straight through the castles, kicking them over, burying the flowers, scattering the chosen stones. Maurice followed, laughing, and added to the destruction. The three little ones paused in their game and looked up. As it happened, the particular marks in which they were interested had not been touched, so they made no protest. Only Percival began to whimper with an eyeful of sand, and Maurice hurried away. In his other life, Maurice had received chastisement for filling a younger eye with sand. Now, though there was no parent to let fall a heavy hand, Maurice still felt the unease of wrongdoing. At the back of his mind uh, formed the uncertain outlines of an excuse. He muttered something about a swim and broke into a trot. And that lets you know that Maurice here, or Morris, however you want to pronounce it, I like to say Maurice, uh, he's still mostly civilized. He's still thinking in terms of getting in trouble for kicking sand into this kid's eye. So, again, pay attention to the development of savagery versus civilization over the course of this chapter. Wa uh, Roger remained watching the little ones. He was not noticeably darker than when he had dropped in, but the shock of black hair down the nape of his neck and low on his forehead seemed to suit his gloomy face and made what had seemed at first an unsociable remoteness into something forbidding. This is kind of a scary guy here, Roger. Percival finished his whimper and went on playing, for the tears had washed the sand away. Johnny watched him with china-blue eyes then began to fling up sand in a shower, and personally, uh, presently Percival was crying again. When Henry tired of his play and wandered off along the beach, Roger followed him, keeping beneath the palms and drifting casually in the same direction. Henry walked at a distance from the palms in the shade because he was too young to keep himself out of the sun. He went down the beach and busied himself at the water's edge. The great Pacific tide was coming in, and every few seconds the relatively still water of the lagoon heaved forward an inch. There were creatures that lived in this last fling of the sea, tiny transparencies that came questing in with the water over the hot, dry sand. With impalpable organs of sense, they examined this new field. Perhaps food had appeared where, at the last incursion, there had been none. Bird droppings, insects, perhaps any of the strewn detritus of landward life. Like a myriad of tiny teeth in a saw, the transparencies came scavenging over the beach. This was fascinating to Henry. He poked about with a bit of stick that itself was wave-worn and whitened and a vagrant, and tried to control the motions of the scavengers. He made little runnels that the tide filled and tried to crowd them with creatures. He became absorbed beyond mere happiness as he felt himself exercising control over living things. He talked to them, urging them, ordering them. Driven back by the tide, his footprints became bays in which they were trapped and gave him the illusion of mastery. He squatted on his hands at the water's edge, bowed, with a shock of hair falling over his forehead and past his eyes, and the afternoon sun emptied down invisible arrows. Roger waited, too. At first he had hidden behind a great palm, but Henry's absorption with the transparencies was so obvious that at last he stood out in full view. He looked along the beach. Percival had gone off crying, and Johnny was left in triumphant possession of the castles. He sat there, crooning to himself and throwing sand at an imaginary Percival. Beyond him, Roger could see the platform and the glints of spray where Ralph and Simon and Piggy and Maurice were diving in the pool. He listened carefully, but could only just hear them. So it's like he's checking to make sure he's alone, which is kind of a creepy thing here. A sudden breeze shook the fringe of palm trees so that the fronds tossed and fluttered. Sixty feet above Roger, several nuts, 
fibrous lumps as big as rugby balls were loosed from their stems. They fell about him with a series of hard thumps, and he was not touched. Roger did not consider his escape, but looked from the nuts to Henry and back again. The subsoil beneath the palm trees was a raised beach, and generations of palms had worked loose, and the stones that had had worked loose in this, the stones that had laid on the sands of another shore. Roger stooped, picked up a stone, aimed and threw it at Henry. Threw it to miss. The stone, that token of a preposterous time, bounced five yards to Henry's right and fell in the water. Roger gathered a handful of stones and began to throw them. Yet there was a space round Henry, perhaps six yards in diameter, into which he dare not throw. Here, invisible yet strong, was the taboo of the old life. Round the squatting child was the protection of parents and school and policemen and the law. Roger's arm was conditioned by a civilization that knew nothing of him and was in ruins. So this is an interesting scene where Henry is kind of in control of these little tiny creatures and he's ordering them about and making... Um, making them do different things, and then here's Roger behind him, and Roger is kind of feeling a, a bit of a dominance over Henry as well, and he's throwing these stones at him, but he's throwing to miss, because even on this island where there are no real laws or rules or grown-ups, Roger is still conditioned by civilization. He's still afraid to hit Henry with a rock because he's afraid of getting in trouble still. So, he's a very interesting character to keep an eye on his development.